um, at the end of the, the session. So, um, Adrian, um, if you want to um, start sharing your screen, um, and then we'll kind of uh, leave it over to you, if that's all right. Hey, John, if you could just turn yours off. So, there we go. Okay, um, well, thanks, John and, and Jamie, for inviting me. It's not often we get to do this um, normally work in a fairly hectic environment, uh, which pretty much all the analysts know. So it's a kind of strange experience for us having some time to ourselves. Um, so um, when Jamie spoke to me about this, he basically said to talk about my experience in, in the industry and um, You'll see I'm a little bit older than some of the other analysts. Um, so I had a period before I worked as an analyst um, working outside of sport. But um, from roughly around 2005, started working in coaching and, and, and as an analyst. So over time, my sport has changed and also the kind of role I've, I've fulfilled in teams has changed as well. So um, just a brief outline of, of what we'll get through is looking at my background briefly and then moving on to my role at the Sharks as it stands at the moment and also a little bit about my philosophy and also more specifically the philosophy of, of how the Sharks are trying to look at things and, and actually simplify what we do. Um, so to start off with, I started, um, so I studied in sport, finished in 1996, which sounds like um, a year that didn't exist for a lot of current students. And after that, actually moved out of sport and worked um, in a database management company for a while, um, and then started coaching hockey again. And it was kind of, once I returned from being overseas, um, started coaching some teams and saw an opportunity in analysis. Um, very little was being done. And I kind of started my own business, which was quite tough because people didn't see much value in it at the time, but um, it also led to an opportunity to work with the national hockey team. Um, and that was towards the end of 2005. And it was really unbelievably quickly that I went from starting with the team to a Commonwealth Games in the, in the March of 2006. So there was a period working with the national team. And for those of who, who know hockey, obviously at that stage, very little money, um, no full-time programs. I remember clearly Danny Carey with the English team announcing in 2009 that they would go full-time. And it was really strange for, for everyone. Um, and that was ultimately the process that then led to them winning Olympic gold. So you'll see a couple of um, logos up there. During that time working with SA Hockey, I was, was also doing other bits and pieces because, as I said, it wasn't a full-time job. So a um, little, little bit of work for the FIH presenting some Olympic solidarity courses, which um, to countries like Namibia and, and doing a bit of travel in Africa, which was, was interesting. And then I then took up a position at St. John's College. And that was one of the first positions in the country where a school actually employed someone to take care of the analysis across the board. So was really good for me because it included other sports that I hadn't spent much time in. Um, luckily in South Africa, if you, you do spend time in rugby, whether you like it or not, it's just um, how you grow up. And our schools all, all play rugby with a lot of emphasis on that as well. So um, again, during that time, I also started doing some work with um, sports tech at the time, which eventually would be bought by Huddle. And had a really good relationship with the, the owners, Simon and Philip Jackson, and started doing a little bit of, of training and support for them. The massive advantage of that was having access to, to some of the, the clients that they were servicing. Um, and I got to do a little bit of work with Kenya Rugby, mainly the sevens team through Paul True. And that was mainly scripting reports for them. So, uh, but it did give me a little bit of insight into how Paul was uh, putting a program together. 
a similar thing with Namibian rugby. And that was again setting up their, their analysis, um, which had moved on to sports code. So a very, very small setup, but, but again, nice to spend some time in a, a different environment from hockey. At that time, I then moved away from St. John's College and uh, took up a position with the University of Johannesburg. And again, it was working across a number of sports, which included uh, netball and uh, football at the time as well, which, which gave me access to, again, some, some really good coaches. Uh, Bradley Cornell, who's with uh, New York Red Bull, was the head coach at the time. And the main thing that stood out for me in that period was how differently each sport was implementing analysis. And um, sometimes frustrating, but also seeing where opportunity was to, to actually improve things in those areas. And then in, in 2015, um, Gary Gold, who was the head coach at the time, of, uh, he had just moved to the Sharks in, in 2015. He was trying to move the union onto sports code and needed an analyst who could assist with that process. So I started with the Sharks in um, the Curry Cup, which is the, the provincial tournament at the end of 2015. And then that would go on to become a, a full-time role starting with Super Rugby the, the following year. Obviously the advantage of, of working in one of the bigger franchises is you do have access to um, our, our national coaches who spend quite a bit of time with us. And we're really fortunate that the current coach is actually a guy who's traveled quite a bit with us. Um, he's been on some of our Super Rugby tours with us. And he, even this season before he was appointed, he was spending um, once every second week, he was coming and running a session for us. So that led to an opportunity to assist the Springboks for a week in, in 2018, which was the week before the England test in Johannesburg. And it gave me some fascinating insight into how that coaching team was thinking at the time. Um, I don't think any of us knew that 18 months later, we would go on to beat England in the World Cup final. And I don't think many people appreciate how much work they had to do in such a short space of time to get that team to, to a position to win that tournament. Um, and then you'll see the last two logos there is um, more recently, in 2019, I started doing a little bit of work with Canadian hockey through a previous coach I'd worked with. And that was process involving Olympic qualification and the Pan American Games. And ultimately, it was a process that led to us missing out on a shootout to Ireland in Dublin in November last year. So a bit of a traumatic experience, but um, sometimes you have those. Um, and it was quite different to having been in a team that had qualified for previous Olympics. So seeing the other side of it. Then in terms of tournaments, obviously the world of analysis is, you know, I always joke it's the, the best job in the world. Um, my son once told his teachers that I want sport for a living. Um, but I've been incredibly fortunate. As I said, I started off first major tournament was Commonwealth Games in Melbourne then went on to be lucky enough to go to, to Glas another Commonwealth Games in Glasgow, the uh, two Olympics, and then some various other events, which each of these events kind of shaped how I think about the job I do. And also, as I look back on them, I realized how little I knew in those first ones I went to. Um, I thought I was incredibly smart, but um, as I said, each tournament I go to, or each event I'm involved in, I realize that I, I actually didn't know too much at the time. What I've done is then just put a couple of photographs in to, to highlight some of the influences and, and people who have shaped the way I learned to go about my job and particularly grateful to hockey as a sport because it is one of the sports where you, you have to learn really quickly. You have limited resources. You've got to be um, very resourceful. You do a lot of the stuff yourself. So filming and live coding at the same time. But the beauty of hockey is that you are on a platform at major tournaments with a group of other guys who, who know a lot between them. So in this picture in the top left, um, there's two guys I'll point out because um, they were guys I learned an incredible amount from. 
Um, Ian Hicks, who's a bit of a legend, was with Australian hockey and has been with New Zealand for about 11 years now. Um, and Lars Skelas from, from the Netherlands. So these were guys who you can't help when you work next to them to, to pick up a couple of, of things, um, start to understand how some of those, those teams who are successful are thinking. Um, and it's something I really miss in rugby. We don't tend to talk that often to other analysts. We sometimes on match day will have a brief conversation with, with each other. And it's normally about, uh, do you have a copy of the, the reverse angle for me? And that's kind of pretty much as far as it goes. This next picture is our, our current coaching staff, um, Sean, our head coach. Um, and then the guy with the uh, plastic leg on the end there is my assistant, um, Blake. And these are guys that I, I learn from every day. They, they bring different ideas in all the time. And this picture also symbolizes for me the, all the coaches I've worked with. Um, guys who are in football or rugby will know that um, it's often uh, changes the norm. You, I've had three head coaches in my time at the Sharks, uh, various assistant coaches, and you, you learn an incredible amount from each guy. There is a temptation when a new coach comes in that you really want to kick against some of the ideas he brings in because um, you get set in your ways. But I, I try to remind myself that you actually learn from everyone. So um, take what you can and, and often there'll be something new that every coach brings in. So, um, and over time, kind of t picking out the best pieces and um, putting together a system that, that really is not your knowledge, but knowledge of, of some of the best guys you've worked with. Photograph on the end with the ridiculous hat was um, fairly recently for me. Um, in 2017, I did the master's course at uh, Worcester University. And it was something that I, I hadn't had access to previously with courses not often offered lo <coughs> excuse me, locally. And, and also um, something with a full-time job that was quite difficult to do. So it was very insightful for me to, to see the academic side of it and certainly um, did change the way I viewed certain things and uh, also pointed out a few uh, glaring holes in, in what we were doing. So a very, um, very successful year for me, uh, enjoyable year, and, and also more importantly, made some really good connections who I still keep in touch with. Then the, the bottom row of photographs, the, all the um, accreditations on the left again, is just a reminder of, of the tournaments you go to, what you learn from them, and that some of the stuff you, you, you learn you kind of forget that um, you went through all of that as an analyst, but uh, a good reminder for me, I keep them hanging up on a wall somewhere. Um, and then this guy here was a previous coach I worked with, and he now actually works outside of, of rugby. He's gone into teaching, and um, it's a guy I have a conversation with probably once a, once a week or once every two weeks. And for me, it's really important because he's kind of an honesty check for me because he has no interest or, or should I say um, nothing to gain from the, the, the things we discuss but we'll often have some really insightful things so he's, he's kind of a, a critical friend that will give his input and, and often point out things that when you're too close to a team sometimes you don't really want to see or hear. Um, and then the bottom, bottom guys here um, was our um, Pan American Games experience and the coach in the middle there is a guy Giles Bonnet who I'd worked with previously with South African hockey. I have an incredibly great working relationship with him and we talk fairly regularly and, and it's often about the team he's involved with at the time. He's now with the Chinese national team. Um, but again, it's just a, a guy in a different sport who we have really good conversations with. And um, the same goes for, for Patrick uh, on his right as a, a guy who used to coach and then worked with me with the national under 21 team. But, for me, all of these things piece together how I, I see the job I do. And I don't think with any one of these groups missing, I would have kind of sat where I am today. And they also reminded me that um, I'm not so smart. And actually, um, a lot of them are way smarter than me and give me way better ideas than I come up with. Um, and then just three, three significant teams for me over, over time that I've worked with um, that 
top up here is the South African women's hockey team, which I spent uh, about eight years with and some great times, some, some tough times as well in a, in a sport that is really a, a small sport in our country. This picture was taken in, in Delhi. We had just qualified for the London Olympics and it was a really strange process. The, the usual path for South Africa to qualify is through Africa. Um, in 2008, we won the Africa Cup and qualified for Beijing. But in, in 2011, when we won the Africa Cup, our National Olympic Committee felt the path was too easy to go to, to London and actually handed our qualification back. We were then given a, a second option of going to a, a Six Nations tournament in, in Delhi, which was an Olympic qualifier, and we had to then win that tournament. And very different for us. A lot of um, meticulous planning went into that. Um, on the Tuesday, we got ourselves into a bit of a corner. We drew to Italy and were on our way out of the tournament, but managed to, to beat India on the Wednesday and beat them in the final again and qualify. And it still is one of those tournaments that, that really I'm incredibly proud of as, as, a, as an analyst, but also as a coaching staff, because it, it was one of the toughest things we had to do. The next picture um, is the opposite of that, not qualifying for the Olympics. But I have to say, one of the most incredible teams I've ever had the privilege of working with. Um, a team that had sacrificed everything. They moved themselves from Canada to Belgium for um, a year. Um, the captain who was married was, hadn't seen her, her husband for months. So I think that's a, not a bad thing, um, but uh, it was really a lot of sacrifice. And it was a team who was ranked 21 in the world. And over the space of 18 months, we managed to get to 15 in the world and end up with a, a double leg shootout against um, Ireland. And we drew on the Saturday, we drew on the Sunday, and we were three one up in the shootout. It is one of those things that in women's hockey, if you three one up in a shootout, it's highly unlikely you will lose. You will lose. Um, but it does happen and it did happen and it was incredibly traumatic but having been able to step away from it later and, and looking at the lessons learned it is still um, one of the most incredible campaigns I've ever been involved with and I, ha I have to hand a huge amount of credit to the Sharks who gave me some time in between Super Rugby and Curry Cup to to attend the Pan Am Games which is part of this and um, from a, a work perspective, it was, it was also brilliant because I'd been working at the Sharks for four years and it was a really good reminder of going back to kind of my roots as an analyst, um, a reminder of how privileged we are um, to have the resources we have and, and the environment we work in. And then this last team photograph is obviously, um, anyone who works in analysis will know you have a lot of trauma, you have uh, a lot of hard times, but um, when you do have those, those times that you, you win things, and um, particularly this competition, which is our oldest, um, uh, it's our oldest domestic competition, the Curry Cup. And this was my first major trophy with the Sharks. So um, incredible experience, uh, fantastic day. Um, and from, from then on, it was, it was also interesting where this team moved on to. So um, that takes me on to where we are now. So, this is our current group, um, handsome looking bunch of guys, the coaches I'm talking about, of course. Um, these guys are fairly new team in, in terms of what has happened at the Sharks in the last two years. So uh, we went through uh, a period where we lost nine senior forwards from, from our pack, um, guys with a huge amount of experience and guys who were considered to be really big players for us. So going into, and this is normal, in, in South African rugby, um, New Zealand have the same, Australia have the same. We lose a lot of players to Northern Hemisphere teams. So um, the Sale Sharks resembles um, the Sharks from two years ago quite uh, significantly. Um, Kuni Ustays and Akafana have uh, the three Dupree brothers. Um, so it is the normal for us, but this was slightly different. Sean Everett came in as the coach. He um, brought in a couple of the young guys that he had used in his under-19 Curry Cup winning team. And we had also signed some, some guys. Um, Oxford joined us from, from the Cheetahs, um, Henku Fenter from the Cheetahs, 
uh, not yet joined us from from the Stormers. So, and this collection of guys was was a really interesting dynamic from the start because um, the young guys brought an incredible energy, and it was really great to see how some of our senior guys who'd been there for a while started to train a little harder, um, and and just realised that actually Sean will pick any guy. If he if he feels he's good enough and if he feels he's um, putting the effort in, so the long and short of it is we we've gone um, seven weeks into to Super Rugby. We were we were sitting top of the table when the um, competition was halted. Again, it's a little bit false, although we won't tell people that as we had played one more game than some of the teams. But um, we had gone on our overseas tour, which is normally a month. We had we had got through that tour and we had only lost one game. So. But more importantly than the results for us is um, the performances and how we had pretty much focused on our performance and how we were trying to play. So we're not naive enough to think that um, we are where we need to be. We know we have significant improvements we need to make, but it really is a great team to be a part of. And, and I, I remember saying to my wife early in the tournament that I genuinely feel that this group is on the brink of something special. And by that, I don't necessarily mean results, but it is just a fantastic environment to be part of. So a little bit about us. We are extremely fortunate to be based in Durban. Um, this is our home, Kings Park at the top, our training field over here. And we, and we are also fortunate that all our facilities are actually at our match day venue. So our, um, Gym and coaches' offices sit just behind the stadium now, um, down this end here, and we have um, our team meeting rooms underneath this, the stadium here. And as you'll see, we're very close to the beach. Um, we have a favorite coffee shop right on the beach, which our coaches don't get to enough, but it is really a, a good environment. It can be a challenging environment because sometimes uh, living in Durban is very easy, um, and the players need to be reminded sometimes that um, you do have a job to do as a, a professional sportsman. Our year looks um, something like this. Uh, and again, this, uh, this was what the year would have looked like, very different now. None of us really know where we're going from here, but um, a normal year would look something similar to this. So our competition is split in, into, or we, should I say our year is split into two parts. We have our main Super Rugby at the start of the year. So, um, and this year that was gonna run from, from um, end of January. We started really early this year and would run until June. We would then have our, our back end of the year, which is our Curry Cup, our domestic competition. So um, pre-season, we got going really early this year. Um, the second part of our pre-season was um, warm-up games. And you'll see going back to November last year, our pre-season started roughly around November. So uh, guys hate this time of the year. You get to a point where all you want to do is get, uh, get the guys playing again. but really useful time of the year for us. We spend a lot of time looking at um, the reporting we're doing. Is it actually making sense to us? Are we learning um, from those reports? Should we be throwing some of them out? Um, and particularly if we have some new coaches come in, this is an important time for us. Um, we also have the international window where there will be test matches on the go and we would then go into pre-season for Curry Cup. Looking back at previous years, this is slightly different. We had, um, in previous years, we used to have an international window in the middle of Super Rugby and then go into a six week finish of Super Rugby post that. Okay, so um, pretty much what a year looks like. As I said, now there's, there's talk of um, a shortened uh, competition, local competition here, and then going into a revised Curry Cup competition, but we're playing it week by week at the moment. Um, as we hear more coming, we'll, we'll get a better idea. Just in terms of the logistics of Super Rugby, um, it, it is an incredibly bizarre tournament with teams spread all over the world. So when you talk about an away game, uh, it really is an away game when you end up going down and playing um, the Highlanders in the bottom end of the world here, or um, the Sunwolves in, in either Tokyo or Singapore and, and the Jags in, in Buenos Aires. So 
some incredibly difficult logistics involved with this, and I'll, I'll talk through some of them now. So the first issue for us is, is travel. We will go on a four week tour every year, and that will involve two weeks in Australia and two weeks in New Zealand. We will also then spend one week in Argentina. We may have one week in Tokyo or Singapore. We, we've been fortunate only to go to Singapore. And I say that not because I have anything against Tokyo, but mainly because the Singapore trip is significantly easier than the, uh, the Tokyo trip. Um, some of the challenges involved with, with the travel is obviously your, your first game you play, that first week of training is incredibly difficult with the time difference. Um, we will normally leave on a Sunday post Saturday match and we would get to Sydney, for example, on a Monday evening. Um, Tuesday would be quite uh, a laid back session because the guy, and it would mainly be Tuesday afternoon just to get some, some mileage in the guy's legs. And then we would, would play around how we would shift Thursday. Um, we would either train the Wednesday, have the Thursday off, or, or depending how we do it, sometimes we would train Thursday, uh, Captain's Friday, and, and play on, on the Saturday. Um, we have had a situation previously last year. We had um, a final playoff game against the Stormers. We were down on the scoreboard on, on the full-time hooter, went the length of the field, ball in play for about two and a half minutes and scored in the corner, which suddenly meant from having gone out of the tournament, we were back in the playoffs. And then we're told that night we were leaving at three o'clock to fly to Sydney the next afternoon. The only difficulty was we were only landing in Durban at one o'clock on, on the Sunday afternoon. So um, a lot of the guys' wives met them at the, the airport with um, a bag and we went straight on to Sydney. Um, stayed in Sydney for the week and then traveled through to Canberra later on, on the Thursday. So th those are not uncommon things that can happen once you get to playoffs. The reverse coming back, we will often play on a Saturday night. Um, we've had games in the past in New Plymouth or Napier, for example, where we've then caught a flight at 11 o'clock post game. We've flown into Auckland, landed at uh, midnight, got into the hotel at one, checked out of the hotel at four in the morning and caught the flight to, to Sydney and then have uh, back to Johannesburg, which gets us in on a Sunday night. So those are kind of the, the schedules that, that get um, interesting, but it's so normal for the guys that um, we are quite used to it. But um, we were lucky to get our travel done really early this year for two reasons, obviously, we managed to get it done before everything was, was put into shutdown. And the second thing is being a newish team, it was really good for us because we were, were able to spend a month on tour, um, guys getting to know each other a lot, and, and also the coaches getting to spend a lot of time with the players. Just in terms of a, a normal working week for us, this, is, uh, this was pretty much our, our last week be, before our last game. And... Things have changed, obviously, over the times with various coaches, but, but this is kind of uh, the, the norm. Monday morning meetings, um, coaches meetings and medical meetings, moving into unit meetings with the players, um, and then obviously guys having one-on-ones with players. Um, all these meetings in black are, are the meetings that uh, Blake and myself as the, the two analysts will need to be in, and occasionally we'll, we will be in these units meetings. In previous years, we used to sit in all of these meetings and the dilemma was we were actually having very little time to get through our other workload. Um, we will have a, a training on Monday afternoon, which is fairly light and it's normally just um, restarts and some of our kicking game. Tuesday, we go into a, a double, so units in the morning and a field session in the afternoon. And the way we split the load with the two analysts is I tend to stay with the backs and Blake, who works with me, will be with the forwards. Um, and Blake's background is uh, he comes from a refereeing background, which is incredibly useful for us because um, it helps us in our, in our training sessions, but it also helps us getting a, get an understanding of um, how referees are interpreting things. 
but also how they are um, approaching games on, on weekends. So um, Blake does an incredible amount of background work on that. Um, South African rugby assist us with um, some referee profiles as well. And that will include um, things like, is a, is a referee more scientific in his approach? Um, how does he communicate? What type of communication will irritate him? Uh, and try to steer clear of those things. And how do you best get him to um, engage on the weekend? So Blake, is, um, he does that post-game uh, as well in terms of feeding back on, on the, the, the interpretation of the referee on the weekend and, and where we feel um, maybe we had come unstuck or where we felt maybe there were, there were areas that um, the referee uh, is open to discussion on certain things. Um, again, how much you can influence referees is a, is, is a tricky one because I, I've seen it backfire more than it's um, gone well. But for us, it's, it's more getting the best value on the weekend um, for us in terms of how we engage with the referee and how he's interpreting things. And then you'll see this uh, big day here in the middle, Wednesday, which is the, the free day. Um, our players will come in the morning and they'll work on, on some individual, individual stuff. And we as a staff will often be in in the morning, but we try to get away fairly early um, just to get some, some time during the week. The back end of the week starts to get a little quieter. We will have one session on the Thursday. Um, and then this afternoon session will either be used for um, uh, a mentorship session with some players or if the Players Association come in and talk to the guys, um, it will be in, in that, that period. And then in the afternoon, I will present to the coaches on the opposition we are playing um, in pretty much 10 days' time. So... My main work during this period here, these three days, is looking at the opposition that we will, are playing the following weekend, so not the weekend coming up. And then um, finally, Friday, really, really late back day, um, captain's practice. Um, we'll touch on a couple of things um, for the weekend. And then we will also have a period where the coaches will, will maybe start working on the opposition from the previous week. Each coach has his unique way of, of how he approaches it. Um, one of our coaches likes to look at one previous game of, of the opposition each day. Another guy li likes to look at some database stuff that we put together for them. Um, but we'll talk a, a little bit more about that later. And then finally, um, Saturday, match day. Um, our, our coach um, has a fantastic philosophy on this. He says, you know, this is our reward for the week. Um, Match day shouldn't be a stressful event. Um, it really should be the reward for us on the weekend. And, and I've worked with coaches who have uh, different approaches on match day. Some get, are really highly strung, extremely emotional. Um, our current group is, is fairly good. Um, I think a little, a, a little bit more laid back than previous groups, but um, also I'd prefer that in the box simply because I think uh, we can be more precise in what we're doing up in the box. You'll see the picture on the right is actually taken at uh, a game against the Waratahs. We don't have as much space in our coaches' box as this, but the setup is fairly similar. We have um, four computers up there, um, the main match code, and then the three coaches' computers. So there's a, a lot of discussion on what are analysts doing live in the game. I know a lot of the team's head analyst is not coding at all. He's looking for specific things in the game and feeding that information back to coaches. We have it slightly different is that I do code the game uh, myself. And our main reason behind that is we try to keep our, our setup on match day the same as it would be whether we're playing home or away. Now, with our travel in Super Rugby, we will travel only with nine or 10 staff members. And that pretty much leaves room for one analyst. So away games is myself. Uh, the other staff will obviously be your, your S&C, your manager, um, your doctor. We have three coaches and a scrum coach who doesn't travel with us. In previous years, we had up to about six coaches. Um, much better to have the three. Much easier for us as the, the analyst being able to get very specific information to each coach. And also, I, I think it just gives each coach more time with the players. Um, you know, previously we sometimes felt 
that guys were having to rush in there a couple of minutes with, with each guy. So um, the current group is, is really good to work with and they each have very different ways of working, which you, you learn over time. Um, and again, I've learned an incredible amount in terms of how they go about some of their work, their workflow. Just in terms of some of the, the back end of our match day capture, we have moved from version 11, um, sports code version 11 to huddle sports code for our capture. And the main reason for that was, was the multi-angle capture and the benefits that's given us. So the standard uh, setup for us is um, our four SDI feeds coming in from the broadcaster. And this is a requirement, uh, a Sansar requirement for each broadcaster to provide. So they currently provide us with a, a TX or broadcast view, a wide angle view, an end on, and a tight view. Um, this year, the requirements from Sansar is that we also have to provide a reverse angle. Um, and because the broadcasters don't provide that for us, we provide that if you are the home team, you're required to provide that. So we have a third analyst who, who works with our junior team that on match day will film that reverse angle. Um, and then we, we are required to upload that post game. Um, there are varying degrees of quality in terms of the, these end views coming in. And it's, um, it, it's obviously to do with the different broadcasters, each region. So New Zealand, Australia, Argentina, South Africa are using. And we often find some of the broadcast uh, or the end views, the camera gets in too tight, so we can't see enough. So some teams have reverted to doing their own end view to get a, a better picture of, of team structures. Um, again, it, it comes down to the manpower you have. And I think going forward, we all gonna go back to the old days where we had fewer people um, with um, finance becoming difficult in, in these times. So. Um, these four SDI views then go into an Antrica converter um, and we capture um, IP feeds that go into a gigabit switch and then one into the capture machine, which, which I sit behind, and then three coaches machines. Um, the coaches have access to my live codes. They also have access to a, a stats report that runs in the background, although I will say that it hasn't really been used this, this year. Um, and it's, again, just preference of coaches. Guys are more interested in, in reviewing footage and, and trying to spot areas that um, we can get messages down to the field um, as opposed to looking at uh, statistical numbers. Uh, and again, there's no wrong or right way. This is just a, a system that's evolved for us and, and kind of works for us. Um, it will change as we go. Uh, I think that's the norm for us if I look how we've changed over time. Um, I will say that the multi-angle capture has been absolutely rock solid for us. I know one or two teams have had a few glitches. It's, it's been fantastic and it really has changed things for us in terms of timeframes. Um, uh, the, the big thing for us is we have knocked pretty much an hour of uh, post game. Um, and that's quite significant when we, when we finish up a, a game at nine at night. Um, it means we can get home at midnight as opposed to one in the morning. Moving on to our, our post game, and this is immediate um, post game. First process for us is to get the information to the coaches. So we will copy the coded game onto each guy's hard drive. Um, those are our three coaches, our scrum coach, the analysts, and the reverse angle, the opposition teams who, who are um, playing us on the day will, will often ask for the reverse angle, which we filmed ourselves. The next process for us is uploading the four views that are a requirement by Sansa. Um, we've moved from 720 to 1080p this year, um, increase in file size pretty much from four gig to about six gig per file. So um, six times four is our standard upload post game is pretty much between 20 to 24 gig. Um, we have a six hour time frame. We try to get that up by two, two hours um, at most. Um, again, sometimes there are glitches if you've had a, a technical issue, but um, for us, we, we don't see an issue with trying to get this up before we leave the stadium. Um, and as I said, we normally leave in the stadium about midnight on, on match day. We've been fortunate this year. We've had a number of um, three o'clock games, which is fantastic. I know some of the 
spectators don't prefer it, but um, for us it's bliss because it means we get home at a, a realistic time. The third process for us is then our huddle upload, and, and this is a just a straightforward match day code, uh, um, the, which we compress into a, we cut all the dead time out and that goes out to the playing group. Um, we've tried not to share it with our full super rugby squad sometimes. You, you do have an issue sometimes where you have players who aren't maybe in your, your main 35 and you share it with them and guys start getting a little bit irritated. So, well, hang on, why are you sharing with this information with me? I'm actually now with um, the super sport group, which is our, our next group. So sometimes you just need to be a little bit sensitive with um, who you're sending stuff to. Um, but that's normally cleared with the coaches. So we do sometimes set up a single group to share match information within the lead up to the game. So any specific stuff leading into a week might only go to say the 23 who are playing. Um, and again, that's decided on a weekly basis, depending on how we feel um, things are going. And then the final thing, which doesn't really happen often, um, we've had, in five years, probably four of these, and only one has come back as um, a guy actually picking up a suspension. Um, and that's if, there, if there's anything that we feel needs to be cited. Um, our coaches don't really like doing it, and unless it's something pretty blatant. Um, we don't really like doing it. It's not something you like seeing players getting suspended, but um, it does happen from time to time. So, you know, that's, that's pretty much our, um, our match day up until we leave the stadium. And then obviously Sunday is a, is a pretty big working day for us. And this has changed over time for me, um, but it has also shifted based on the requirements of coaches and in terms of what reporting we, we look at. So for me, a Sunday morning will we'll mainly focus on two things. The first thing is... Um, the reports we receive from our, our data supplier. So we use Stats Perform, and they send us a match report and a full XML on a Sunday morning. That is then imported into, into Sports Code. We then send this report directly to the coaches, which is a change from previous years. We used to have our own uh, Sports Code match report, which which pulled data from our, from our um, timeline. We've moved away from that purely because a lot of it was just repeating, um, just repeating what we were doing. Um, and we felt we didn't really want to go there. The, the, the second reason we moved away was each coach has kind of got his own bespoke report that he's looking at. So we have, uh, I do one report for our forwards coach, which looks at a couple of things. And that includes, um, it includes information uh, like mauling meters, which pretty much stuff that's not in our stats data. Um, from this information, coaches will have a look at things, but most of the coaches have very specific stuff they work on on a, on a Sunday morning. The head coach, um, Sean, will look at uh, ball in play and he will go through and pick out pretty much themes that he feels we need to look at. Uh, Dave, the attack coach, has a very specific thing he looks at, and, and we'll get to it now. In, uh, and it basically looks at our game model and, and how we look at those things. And then uh, Brent has a, a really heavy Sunday. He's looking at, obviously, um, lineouts, but he's also looking at some of the forward stuff, the breakdown. Um, the second thing on, on the Sunday for me is getting this inform information out, and that's the individual stuff to coaches, um, and that's the individual player data. These two reports over here are sports code output reports, which coaches um, use to get a better idea. And then on the right-hand side is, is an efficiency report we do. Um, and it's not used weekly, but I, I look at this just to get an idea of uh, two things. It, it's that uh, number of contributions our players are making in a game and the efficiency of those, but also highlights areas um, we need to look at in terms of player improvement. We're very careful to use this player with the, uh, this report with players because we do find um, you can't tell a player make more contributions. <laughs> You're running around like a headless chicken, so um, or be more efficient. So we we're very careful how we use this information. It's more to to highlight areas for us um, 
across our group of players. We have tried to use it against other teams, but because of differing ball and play times and different styles, it's, it's really tricky to, to, to um, find a norm across competitions using the sufficiency report. Um, again, this is my work. Each coach is doing his stuff in the background and then Blake will be working on the referee stuff on a Sunday as well. Um, the next part of the week for me is the opposition analysis and we move, um, this is done in between all of the normal stuff we're doing, which is the, the match feedback, um, the normal filming of training. I do film a lot of the training myself. Uh, again, not common for a head analyst to be doing it, but I do enjoy it because it does give me a close connection to our, our game model, what we're trying to do. It's my least favorite part of the week. Um, if I never have to film another training again, I'd be incredibly happy. But um, again, um, it is stuff that we feel maybe we are too heavily um, time based on the operational stuff and not en enough on the analytics. So it is stuff we're looking at. And um, obviously, it, we hope to put in more automated systems as we go. But I, I don't think I'd ever move away from, from filming completely because it does give me quite a strong connection to the team. Um, just coming back to the opposition analysis, um, it's, it's something I really enjoy. It's something that uh, Sean has pushed me quite hard on um, in terms of I used to present this to the coaches. This is the first season that I'm now presenting directly to the players, which is very different to my background in hockey where I was presenting to players on a daily basis. So um, enjoying it. Um, also, a great group of players who, who provide a, a good source of, of feedback for us as well. So just in terms of the source of, of opposition analysis, I, I look at a couple of different things. Um, first one is an output report that I've, I've built myself based on information that the coaches require. And this is also a lot of overcoding that's done in the background. So specific stuff on where the opportunities teams um, we play against providers. So um, an example would be on average, how many attacking lineouts? So that's um, attacking lineouts in the opposition half. Do we, can we expect from a team? And that's often based on, on what that team's kicking game is. Are they kicking long? Are they kicking out? Um, are they going contestable? Uh, and basically the idea behind this report is to paint a picture for the coaches. Uh, I'll put in a note here and it's a very, very basic look at the team. So not massive detail, but more their game model, um, the type of maps they're using on attack and to feed that information back to the coaches. So this is presented on a Thursday. I also use information from stats performs trend report we get. And then we also have um, a dashboard that they provide us, which is, which is interactive. And the other sources of information for me, which, which um, I've been using more recently, some normative profiling, which just gives an idea of, of teams, um, kind of their style of play and, and seeing if we can pick up anything here that um, is things we haven't seen or the coaches don't know. And then the bottom two, which is slightly different, is our players who provide fantastic feedback. And it's something that I'm grateful for is the relationship we have with them. Uh, and often you'll have a player who has played for one of those teams previously. So we'll have really good insight into how one of those coaches is, uh, is thinking and how those teams approach things. Um, and then this last one is newspapers. Um, I enjoy reading articles. Again, the press can um, skew things slightly, but you do sometimes get insights into, into how teams are approaching things um, and, and particularly their coaches' mindset. So every time a new group of coaches come in from other teams, you will often just look at some of the previous teams they've worked with. So obviously, um, Jake coming into the Bulls next season, Jake having previously worked with Sean, um, and coaches do evolve, but they still have a lot of fundamental things in place. So um, the, the approach that Jake used at, at um, the Sharks previously and at Montpellier, um, there will be a lot of that that sits in his game plan with the Bulls. So um, the idea for us is to paint this picture 10 days before. We then, coaches will then go and fact check that against the match on the weekend, the final match of that team before we play them. They'll then... Uh, jokingly tell us how wrong we are on the Thursday before, or they'll actually um, validate what we're doing. But it's um, 
good process. And as I said, now I do present this briefly to the players on the Monday. And then the coaches will go into the detail of everything they do specifically um, as, we, as we go into that week. Just in terms of um, my experience in, in how we target our analysis, and this has always been a really difficult thing for us because I went from hockey that had very little data except for the data we were generating ourselves into rugby where we were getting an abundance of data, often very different interpretations of how coaches were seeing that. Often coaches um, pulling some bizarre numbers off um, trend reports and, and, and some really interesting interpretations of those. Um, and for me, the, the questions we were asking was, so how do we accelerate our performance as a team? And particularly because we had gone through a period where we had very little consistency from week to week. The second thing was, how do we make sense of all the data we're getting? There's a lot of stuff we get we don't, we don't use and, and doesn't add value to us. Um, and then the final thing is, so what do we pick out that's relevant to us? And the approach for us, and, and this is again an approach that um, we use at the Sharks. It's something we're working on. It's not something that other teams don't do, but it's, it, it's really been helpful for us. And it is also something that I've used um, with other teams I've worked with, so particularly with Canadian hockey as well. So the framework we use is the standard game model framework, um, the four moments of the game, and then attached to each of these moments of the game are our specific um, parts of, of our game model. So, for example, the transition, the transition from uh, defense to attack, our kick counter long and our kick counter contestable sits in here. And then on each of those areas of the game, we will have four to five points that we are very specific in, in what we do. So it's a sequence of events that happens at that moment of the game. And then for each of those points that we have on that area of the game, we will have specific evaluation points for us. So obviously your um, offensive organization is, is your um, uh, plays of set piece, your maps, um, as I said, transition would be your turnover attack, your uh, kick counter. Your transition from um, attack to defense would be a um, thing we, we, um, we have a very specific term for it. Um, I'm not going to go into that. My our coach gets a bit nervous when we start talking too, too clearly about those details. Um, but what we do the moment we turn the ball over. And again, it's a really good thing to, to pin our evaluation on each week. And Sean is really, really good at driving the performance as opposed to the result because you will lose when you play well and you will play well and lose. So those are the, the kind of points we anchor our analysis on and, and how we come back to those points. And the really good thing for us is there are very specific things that players know they do in each process that have nothing to do with them having the ball. So what is their role in each particular moment of the game what they're doing with the ball what they're doing without the ball and what is what are we trying to achieve in that moment and it's really good because players know they will they will be they are open to to be criticized on these things and it's nothing personal because they know the framework in our team room um, our one wall is plastered with all our game uh, moments related to each of these four game moments and the specific sequence of events that happens. And at any stage, a coach will say to a player, um, what are the, the five processes in our, in, um, in our kick counter long? And they will go through them, they'll rattle them off. Um, it, it, there's nowhere to hide. The players do know it is a very, very important part of our game model that they need to know. Um, I'm gonna actually give you a hockey example. And again, I apologize, I don't really want to, um, move away from the Sharks at, at the moment, but it, it, it will give you an idea of, of how we implemented this in hockey. Um, it is just something that is very relevant to us right now and how we are trying to play that um, our coach's preference is not really to, to show that. So um, this was um, a transition from a defense to attack in, in hockey. Um, and this was specifically a, a turnover attack moment. And the team at the time was, had a concept that they referred to as North. And it was the North thing for them was a name they came up with. And it was, how do we know what, when we're talking about a moment in the game, what is it? Um, 
we don't want to talk about transition from a de defense to attack. They, they just knew as soon as someone shouted north, everyone knew the specific five sequence of events that had to happen. And again, our evaluation came back to these five points and the players were quite specific on it. So the first thing for us was players to force the skill error. The second thing was players above the ball to create the, the depth and width and attack. The player on the ball who, who had won the ball was to immediately look for the most dangerous pass. Support players behind the ball then needed to follow, uh, run through to provide that support. And then if no forward pass was available, what the player would, would then do now. We would then look to drop the ball deeper and wider across the field. And that was very specific to that moment. So I'm going to play a quick video clip that I hope makes sense. Um, and this is kind of, of, of how this would look in terms of the player's understanding and then um, how we would then allocate our analysis to that. Okay, so uh, first, first point to, um, in the step would be to force the skill error. So it would be striker and the midfielder trying to force the error here. Which would create that moment of turnover for us. As that happened, these players above the ball knew they had a job. Um, it was to give us height and width. And that was to open up this middle area of the field to attack. And then players from depth would need to get through. And, and again, this, this we could pin specific points to and specific feedback to. So you'll see here, um, we win the ball. And the next step for us is to make that most dangerous pass. Which, sorry, apologies for that. Uh, so this was an area we knew we could make significant improvements with with uh, Canada because we were traditionally a team that hadn't gone forward really quickly with the ball. So you'll see here, um, traditionally we would dump the ball sideways or backwards. And it was a really small area in the game that we felt there was huge value in and where we could open teams up. It's the same in rugby. It, the, you had to ask me the two most crucial Areas in our game model, it would be our transition both from defense to attack and uh, attack to defense. So you'll see here, again, we go back to our old self and we dump the ball outside. So in the evaluation for it is really simple, um, simple points on did we force the skill error? Yes or no. Did we, create, uh, did we win the turnover? Yes or no. Did we make the most dangerous pass? Yes or no. Did we create the... the, the width and depth and attack. Um, did players follow through from deeper? And then obviously the fifth point, if we didn't do this, what was the alternative here? Um, did we, we play the ball deeper and wider? Um, so again, not rocket science, but really, really useful for us to, to pin our system and our approach on to try to look to improve the consistency in our performance and also Sean's big, big point on being consistent every week, whether you win or you lose. And the, the dangerous part in, in professional sport is the pressure comes from outside. It comes from newspapers. It comes from fans. Um, yeah, uh, can come from boards of directors, all sorts of things. And there's a, I always joke there's a difference between fans and supporters. Um, but it is, it's really important for us because you do start to feel the pressure from outside. And you need to know that what's been said in the press is very far from, from what um, we are seeing and what we know we are trying to look at. And this, um, this kind of leads me on to um, my last point. And in terms of looking at massive amount of data, the, the important thing for me is that I had to get my head around a lot of what is happening in the game is not represented by any numbers. And, um, you know, you talk about the reading between the lines and for us this was a concept that we spent a lot of time on because it is I think where big gains are are to be made in the sport so it's often not whether line outs won or not but what happens before it and I've just put a couple of examples at you and I'll talk through them when the, the clips end we've got flag up over here boys Hold, hold. Good. Yeah, we've got options. Options play, play on. Right. Not 
Knocks it straight over the head of... Okay, so I'll pause that one there. And, and this, is a, this is a concept we, we spend quite a bit of time on. Again, it's, a, it's, a, it's something we've done in hockey as well. And, and it's to do with what is happening kind of between all of those numbers. So, um, yes, the line out is one. It was, um, uh, there was gain line off and, and various things. But what is happening between those line outs? So, this is the, con the concept for us is um, stop start time. So, teams looking to keep you disorganized and really speed up the tempo in games. And it's stuff we spend a lot of time and try to pin that somewhere in our game model because we know that this is actually where teams are, are really picking holes in teams. And again, this is just one example, but you do see a significant difference in the tempo of teams playing in the New Zealand conference and the tempo of teams playing in the South African conference. The challenge is when you then go and play in those other conferences, uh, you play teams who have a higher tempo and also generally speaking, and it's not always the case, a higher ball in play time. And the key thing about teams doing this is they're trying to obviously take teams to, to areas they're not comfortable. So really fatiguing teams, but also trying to make sure you're disorganized and pick your part when you're disorganized. We spend a, a little bit of time with the Canadian team, hockey team as well, looking at how quickly our teams restarting play between uh, the ball going out of the field and coming back in. And we did see a significant difference in the teams in the high ranked teams and those lower ranked teams. And we knew that if we played teams ranked lower than us, we were trying to um, reduce the stop start time and really take them out of their comfort zone. And if we played teams that were ranked higher than us who, who were used to tempo, we would do the opposite. We would really t try to take tempo out of the game. Again, not a, uh, a new concept, but it is an area that we do spend some time on because, um, and you might have seen it if any of you had watched our last Super Rugby game against the Stormers. The Stormers really try to take all the time out of the game they could. Um, loads of injury breaks, um, really slow getting to line out. So um, the challenge is if a team does that to you, how do you stop them doing it? But um, it is an area we look at and it also ties into my next point, which is we often look at parts of the games as sequences. So we will look at something as um, an exit cycle. For example, if a team kicks off to us and we then kick the ball out, our exit cycle also includes the opposition's next phase of play. So we evaluate, are we successful in that exit cycle? If we win both the first part of it, so is us receiving the kickoff, kicking the ball out, if it's our plan for the weekend. And then secondly, did we then defend the next attack? And if you win your exit cycles, you, it takes you a long way to, to winning games. So um, again, that exit cycle is quite nice because it also includes the time between the ball being kicked out and the opposition restarting, which gives you a bit of an indication of, of the tempo of, of, of the game as well. So um, that's kind of our, our philosophy and, and it's become quite a strong philosophy of myself because I, I do see how much time has been wasted previously um, um, in terms of just trying to get your head around numbers. Uh, the numbers are important because you do start to pick up trends but really in a competition where you have short turnaround times, it, it has been fantastic for us to pin things on the scale model. So um, that's pretty much uh, my week and our approach to how we're doing things. Um, I'm gonna show you one last slide, which is uh, just the key learnings. And I'll try to keep it to just three things that I've picked up in my time working as an analyst. So the first thing for me is ultimately it's a people's business. It's a, a difficult people's business because you also have people you develop relationships with who move on um, in the form of staff, in the form of coaches and players. I've tried to look at it as that you learn a lot from each of those guys. And the key thing is if you are unable to develop relationships with people, particularly coaching staff, it is really difficult to be good at what you do in this business. Um, unfortunate, I have had a really good group of guys I've worked with over time. Um, 
every coach has his strength. Some guys might not um, see some coaches as guys that they've really had a good experience with. But generally speaking, I've been very fortunate in my, in my time, um, both at the Sharks and working in hockey. Um, the second point for me is that the skills you possess and that give you the edge in time kind of uh, just disappear or evaporate. And, and I, the example I always use is when I started the Sharks, I was brought there particularly because of my sports skills, um, ability to, to script, ability to set up a system that can work with coaches. And I was looking through some of the Huddle Online stuff the other day, and it does make me laugh because things that you thought were rocket science, pretty much most people can do now or are learning to do quickly. So um, those skills do change. And, and again, that comes down to, again, how are you using those things in practical ways to give your team and your coaching staff the edge? And then the final one, which um, if my wife can hear me sitting in the background is probably gonna start laughing, is um, work-life balance in our job is probably the most difficult thing to find and also the most important thing for us. Um, incredibly difficult when your entire life is dictated by um, a fixture list. And I have learned, and I think this period of, of lockdown has taught me even more, is you have to find stuff that um, you can focus on outside of the game. And uh, you know, for me, and I'm just gonna jump to this next, this final slide. For me, the, the most important thing um, is having a really supportive family in the background. It's, it's very difficult to do this job without that. Also, um, having good people in your environment, having hobbies outside of what you do. Um, and, you know, our guys have some really bizarre hobbies um, from fishing, guys who fish but never catch anything. Um, and I try to get myself on the water and uh, do a bit of paddling at, at times as well. But not always possible, but really, really important. And then just before um, we open up to everyone for questions, just... Um, these slides just highlight a couple of things for me. And, and obviously I've touched on, on family in the corner there. The next is a, a guy, Lukanya Am, who English supporters might realize uh, or remember was involved in both tries against um, England in the World Cup final. He was also the first player I prepared some recruitment footage on when I joined the Sharks. It's gone on to become our captain and obviously uh, a World Cup winner. And, and this was um, taken during the... Uh, week-long parade around the country. And it's just a fantastic experience for me as an analyst, seeing him develop, but also uh, just a fantastic human as well. Um, the guy slowly trudging up the hill was just a reminder for me of um, most of us are in this business because we love sport and we love the experiences it brings. This is our biannual uh, race up Baldwin Street in, in um, Dunedin. The, Players bet on the staff and they have to race up the steepest residential street in the world. Um, we have had a few uh, staff members being treated by our physiotherapists after this. But again, a uh, really fun reminder for me, um, like the picture in the bottom corner of some of the players and myself at the Melbourne Grand Prix. This is what we do this for. We're incredibly fortunate to, to work in professional sport, the opportunities it brings and the people you get to work with. Um, and then just the last two pictures is, is some of the guys I work with. Um, one is a player who, um, Marius Lowe, who is in our Super Rugby squad, wasn't playing on the day, but um, runs on with the water. Just a fantastic guy who never moans if he's not in the match day 23. When he is, gives absolutely everything. Um, but as I said, just, um, it's what it's about. It's It's really is a people's business. And, for anyone who moans about it, uh, hopefully these couple of weeks have brought some sense of reality of, of really how fortunate we are to do what we do. Um, and that's pretty much it for, for me. Uh, obviously, John, we can open up to questions. I feel like I've been uh, talking to or talking at you for a long time. So um, if there are any questions you'd like to answer, have answered, um, I'll see if I can uh, can answer them and um, hopefully they do add some value. No, it's been uh, been fantastic. Thank you, Adrian, uh, first and foremost, for some, some really, really fascinating insights and, and 
a massive kind of learning from that and what i took away, took away probably one of the, the main things that you you mentioned about is the power of kind of reflecting uh, and challenging your own self and your own learning to continually develop and that power of network um, that you've kind of continued to maintain um, despite obviously all the years from from the past and those experiences so so that's massive and that kind of links into who's been on here to, tonight I've just done a quick kind of uh, search through so we've had four or five guys from the English Premiership a couple of guys from uh, over in Ireland working with the national team guys out in Ireland Australia so so that's kind of shows the value and, and hopefully some some really key learning from that um just uh, quickly there's two questions that came through um previously but if anyone else kind of um wants to ask anything of adrian um more than happy to kind of you guys to jump on the mic or or write a comment in the in the chat panel um but just to kind of start with uh adrian just reflecting back on on all of that experience what's been the biggest learning for you to this point I think uh, probably that sometimes we get caught up in thinking what we do is the only thing and the most important thing. Um, and, I, and again, this, this period has, has kind of reminded me, you know, I've watched our CEO and our coaches kind of interact with the playing group and with us and, and, it was a reminder of what they deal with on a daily basis. So an example is I will have something to present to the head coach and not be able to pin him down and forget that he is sitting in front of a press conference. He's dealing with marketing. He's um, having to see a player that maybe is upset because he hasn't been picked. And it's just a reminder that we are an important part, but also a single part of, of a bigger picture. And I think that's just sometimes um, it's easy to start getting ahead of yourself in terms of the importance of what you do and, and hopefully not um, the importance of yourself. And that's why I have a couple of um, good people I chat to quite often, um, as I pointed out earlier, who kind of keep your feet on the ground and, and laugh at you when you think you're too smart or um, uh, you would have seen uh, as I said, Patrick and Giles and, and uh, Guy Van in those pictures. And those, those are guys that are important to me because they also have come a long way with me and I know where we all started off. And, and uh, again, as I said, just um, we are part of something. Uh, we obviously think we're the most important part, but we are just part of something. Okay. And then kind of one kind of final one from me then. Um, so obviously those those different sports um and the, the knowledge and things that you've kind of captured and obviously your, your initial kind of starting out almost as a, as a teacher and a, a lecturer how important has that been in influencing how you think how you process information how you ensure that what you're capturing and the insights you're gaining are actually then passed on to those end individuals I think for me, um, and I, I probably got a little bit better at this when I moved into rugby, was um, the ability to listen. So I think coaches will tell you what they're looking for. Um, most coaches have their own phrases or, or jargon that they, they refer to things by and specific areas of the game that they see as important and, and that they put a lot of value on the danger is that sometimes we take a system we've used and we try to push that onto the new coach who comes in. And the, the thing I've learned probably the most is to, to, to listen to coaches and, and what they are looking for and how you can then take what we have and basically turn that into the information they're requiring. And when you start to feed that information through to coaches, it, it builds a much stronger relationship with them because you are providing them with something that they see of value. And I think that's crucial. The two things for me, 
you have to provide new coaches um, with value for them to start seeing the value in you as an analyst when they, when they join your group and um, also developing a, a relationship that's a little bit broader than rugby with them. So there's a li- there is a trust between, between you. But yeah, so for me, the key thing is the skills of, of listening. And I think, as I said, coming to rugby, I, I was a little bit better at that because my knowledge of, of rugby was not as strong as my knowledge of, of, as, um, in hockey. So I had to listen really um, quite intently to what everyone was saying. Um, so yeah, uh, I think that's probably some of the, the, the skills I had to learn. Okay, no, brilliant. Um, yeah, so just kind of um, throw it out to anyone who, who's got any kind of questions, um, anyone who wants to kind of jump on the on the microphone um, or, or put a question in the chat. Patrick looks like he's just woken up, so um, I, doubt, I doubt we'll get a question from him. No, and it's actually, what's it, uh, 10.50 in the morning. Uh, yeah, great presentation, Adi. And I think, uh, I mean, you've also been a really great model to, uh, role model to me in terms of your, your work ethic and what you've actually learned along the ways and what I've also uh, picked up from you as well and we've bounced ideas. Uh, maybe, Adi, just a question from me, just in terms of, You've spoken about your work processing in terms of match day. So in, in terms of tactics, are you are you giving feedback in terms of specific things that you're seeing that the team could uh, sort of uh, change and execute uh, in that specific moment? Or, you know, what are your key performance indicators during the game? Yeah, so so that, kind of, that will change from week to week. Uh, some of it will change. Obviously, we do have very specifics, and that, again, comes down to what we try to do in each moment of the game. Um, I sometimes do think we overestimate how much influence we can have during the game as, as a coaching group. Um, but what I have found useful is, is almost a, a checklist pre-game of what we are looking for. So... Uh, I know, Pat, we've done, we've done this previously um, in the hockey where we will have a very specific idea of what a team is going to bring on the week. Um, be it a uh, hockey example will be the system they're playing, um, whether they're going to be high-pressing you or not. And just a checklist in those first few minutes of going through, so what is their lineup? Um, what is their approach? Uh, things like the tempo of the game. Um, is there something we seeing in their approach this weekend that maybe wasn't in our, in our pregame analysis of the team? We had that um, Jags we played last season. Hadn't seen line speed the whole, um, the whole tournament. Uh, very proudly said uh, they don't bring any line speed uh, <laughs> and we got absolutely belted by them. So, um, so yeah, I think for, for me, the coaches each have their own, the own checklist. Um, the I think it's difficult sometimes because my information I'm feeding in is also to the coaches and then the coaches will then feed information down to the field. Um, but certainly we do have an idea of what we're looking at. And again, it's not, not necessarily specific KPIs. Those, those KPIs maybe you're talking about are related to game, the game model. Um, okay. uh, yeah, yeah probably doesn't answer your question that well, but yeah, it's kind of how we work in the box on a, on a match day. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Adi. Oh, good. And um, just had one in from Ross, and he's kind of asked, uh, what would your biggest tip be uh, when communicating to players, i.e. the number of messages and the method you go about um, delivering those, those key, basically landing those key, key messages? So for me, landing key messages with... Um, with the players is I will only give a message to them if I know I'm 100% clear on on the information I'm feeding them. Um, And again, the coaches coaches are are getting messages to players more than me and they're dealing with them more than me. Um, So my, my feeding information to players is very specific in terms of relating to one of two things. It's either relating to stats and how it gives us a picture of what they're doing. 
And the other one is if we have spoken to players and are quite clear on something is, again, repeating that. I'm very careful to go into areas where um, it gets a bit vague. At halftime, we do have video down in the change room. So uh, we take one of the, the coaches' computers down with um, stuff that they've put into a movie organiser during the, the first half. As a rule, we wouldn't show them more than one to two clips. Our backs tend not to look at anything. Our forwards will maybe look at um, one, one, maybe two things. We have, again, a lot of teams use it. Um, something we need to stop doing, something we need to continue doing, and something we need to start doing. So those three things. Um, very simple. Also, not much shouting and screaming, fairly level-headed um, in our change in the season. So um, I think a good approach. It, it is, it's a very short period of time you've got to, to get a message to a player. And also, a lot's not going in. Um, our players' procedures in Durban will go into, as they come off the field, they'll go into a cooling room because it's so hot and, and humid in Durban. They come out of the, 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 the cooling room, which is like a big, um, big freezer, basically. They will change their jerseys, um, put a dry jersey on, and then uh, the coaches will spend some time with them. So already, there's not much time. So maybe three, three messages. No good. And then just um, I'll come back to some of the one of the questions that Natasha's kind of uh, mentioned in the moment. But uh, Martin's asked kind of how do how do you keep on up to date with the developments in performance analysis throughout the season? Obviously, the Super Rugby transferring straight into the Curry Cup competition makes it a, a really kind of heavy workload for you. How do you kind of keep up to date with developments in, in the field? Um, again, a network of a network of people you talk to. Um, I think being being naturally curious about what's going on in your industry, um, and a lot of reading. So when I travel, I try to catch up with um, people um, in those in those cities. So um, and you, you realize how important it is not being able to do it anymore, but when we were in Auckland this year, I managed to have lunch with, with Ian Hicks who, with New Zealand Hockey. And it's, it's, it's a fantastic um, way to, to just chat through some of the things they're doing. It's very difficult to keep up. And, and I think when you start to obsess about being at the forefront of the technology you, that teams have, and um, if you were stripped away of all the fancy stuff you had and you had a choice of a couple of things, what would you choose to make you effective? I think is a good way of looking at, uh, at how you work. Um, I remember um, on our Worcester course, I remember someone from Man City talking to us and saying he was there at a time when they had unlimited budgets. They could pretty much buy what they wanted to. And, and over time they realized it's not really, uh, you don't need all the stuff. So, being curious to research the the stuff that's out there that's going to make your system better and more streamlined. And then also maybe run it past some of your coaches. Is it something that they really see value in? Um, you know, I remember seeing some stuff and, and showing our coaching is like, yeah, that's nice, but yeah, we wouldn't use it. So um, yeah, I think just being curious and talking to, to people in your network. Okay. And then um, I think probably last one then to kind of uh, finish up and uh, just wary of, of, of the time and stuff is what kind of bit of advice would you give for either someone who's wanting to, to get in that industry um, or move up into, into their current kind of current role? What's the kind of best bit of advice for, you, for, you, for them really? Uh, get yourself out there. I think you need to do a, you, you need to be, Number one, have a mindset that you work really hard. Um, it, it's sad for me be, in that you can see when we have, um, remember at the University of Johannesburg having some interns and being able to see fairly quickly, and I, I mean fairly quickly within one session with, with uh, students, whether they were going to make it in the industry or not because of um, their mindset uh, towards hard work. And 
and also I think taking up any opportunity you can. So I was fortunate enough to do work across some really different sports and work with some, some people, sometimes for no money, sometimes for very little money. Um, I remember Patrick and myself working with some uh, Olympic swimmers for, for ridiculously little money um, and juggling it because my son was being born the next day. But the experience was, was eye-opening, seeing how swimmers train, which was a sport I'd never been involved with. And then seeing one of those swimmers go on and, and break a world record and, and win gold in London was, you know, it's, it's stuff you, you're really proud of, even though you basically did the underwater filming. That's all you were doing. You weren't doing any analysis on it. But it's all of that work that eventually starts to fall into place. And um, my job at the Sharks came through having been in contact with Gary Gold, who did my original sports code training. And, and it very seldom comes from you not having a network or not having done some work. So get yourselves out there. You're going to do a lot of work. It's going to sometimes feel like you're wasting your time, but um, it, is the, it is the way that most of the guys I speak to who, have, who are sitting in, in better positions in our, our field it's the way they went about it. And I think it's what you need to do. Okay, no, no, brilliant insights. And um, a couple of people have messaged AG. Um, how, how's best to kind of get in touch with, with yourself if any of anyone on tonight has got any kind of follow up questions? The easiest is to email me. Um, based, based on when I studied, um, I, I kind, of, kind of avoid social media. So I do have a Twitter account. I'm not sure if I've ever actually um, looked at anything. And, and part, part of Patrick's been laughing. Part of it is that um, I like avoiding some of the social media mainly because um, you have a lot of people who are quite vicious in terms of how well your team's doing. Um, so the easiest way is just to email me, and it's it's quite simple. It's Adrian A D R I A N at thesharks.co.za. So Adrian at thesharks.co.za. So if you yeah, you know, I'm more than happy to um, to see if I can. Um, answer your questions or um, even if you want to connect and share ideas I know um, it's always great catching up with some guys and again I've not only rugby any sports there's there's massive value in, in talking to people who, who work in other sports and also people who work outside sport. Oh fantastic and um, just uh, just just yeah really appreciate you appreciate your time um, this evening um, learn some huge amount of information from you which is always positive um, just to kind of re remind people, um, we have got another uh, session on Tuesday, the 28th, uh, this time with Ollie Logan from British Swimming. So a different kind of perspective if, if you want, guys want to um, have a listen to Ollie talking. And then we are trying to put on some further kind of series um, throughout the kind of uh, lockdown period and potentially moving on to make it more of a regular thing. So. If you guys want any further information or get us get uh, updates or want us to come on and do a do a uh, presentation, get in touch with us, um, and we'll be more than happy to kind of uh, put something put something in place. So um, no, thank you very much for for tonight, uh, Aiden, Adrian, sorry, and uh, yeah, keep everyone safe and uh, look forward to speaking to you guys soon. Okay, thanks thanks again for your for your time, John. Um, uh, and then I, I just seen a question from Danny there. So um, uh, the player recruitment is pretty much, we unfortunately don't have access to foot, what the data football guys have. So um, it's pretty much getting video you can. Um, and, and also chatting to some of the guys that maybe worked with that player before and then doing our own, piecing our own analysis together on that. Um, but uh, yeah, I've gone on a bit a bit longer. So um, thanks, guys, and we'll hopefully all connect at some stage. Oh, perfect. Thanks, Eddie. Thank you.
How was that, Jamie? Yeah, it was good. Do you want to um, stop recording? <laughs>